Good evening, ladies. Welcome. Good to see everyone here tonight. Um, right now, while the sun is up, it is Passover. And Passover ends at sundown tonight. While we're here, we'll enter uh, the first day of unleavened bread. So now that you've just studied the feast, does that mean a little bit more? And uh, then tomorrow at sundown begins first fruits. So again, God's calendar, God's schedule of events. This year, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday quite early in the year compared to the, uh, the Jewish feasts because I think they go on a solar rather than a, a lunar or something. But uh, anyway, be aware that, um, that Jim asked me if I was going to serve unleavened bread tonight. <laughs> but crackers are a little bit flat. But yeah, they are. That was unintentional. But uh, yes. All right. Well, again, keep mindful of that. This is God's calendar, and we did see that he's fulfilled four of the feasts, and there's three remaining. So it's kind of more exciting to be aware of, of when that comes on our calendar, when we realize that um, God is very aware of the calendar and his schedule. Um, so tonight we are going to cover uh, Lesson 26. We are in Deuteronomy, and tonight we have uh, the first seven chapters of Deuteronomy. Don't look at your homework yet or you might um, <clears throat> be overwhelmed. We have the rest of Deuteronomy next week, okay? Uh, but we're gonna, uh, the thing about Deuteronomy is we've already touched into Deuteronomy so many times, haven't we? And so we're just kind of doing a glance back as we go through the rest. So if you don't get all your marking done and everything next week, that's fine. You have all summer, right? To go back and do it. But we're gonna hit the rest of Deuteronomy next week, and then we will be jumping into Joshua. And so uh, because of the timing, I've put out the uh, DVDs uh, regarding Jericho. There's two different uh, DVDs back there um, by archaeologists who have uncovered Jericho and what they find, the evidence that they have dug up, line up exactly with what we see in God's Word. So be sure to check those out if you want. Um, our schedule... <laughs> We have, I have the schedule up here. We have just four more weeks after tonight, uh, if we, four more lessons, I should say, as long as we don't have to cancel. But April 30th, uh, we'll do 27, and then 28, 29, and 30. There's 30 lessons. And so uh, if we do not have to cancel, that will be our schedule. So the verses we're going to look up that are outside of Genesis through Deuteronomy is Hebrews 11, 12, which is 1881, James 1, which is uh, 1886, and then also John 7, 37 through 38. That's page 1676. 1676, so if you have those. James 1, the first one is 2 to 4, and then later in the lesson we'll cover verse 22. So it's on the same page. Uh, so when you turn to James, keep it there because we'll come back to it as well. And so there's our schedule, there's the verses uh, tonight. We all need Lesson 26, pages 31 through 34. So uh, put page 131 next to 133. Be sure to number your uh, boxes on your class notes. And tonight you got another Bible insert on uh, the names of God, some more of the names of God that we found. Now we handed this out, um, the first names of God I put in my Bible in Genesis 22, I'm not sure where you all put it in, but uh, we covered um, uh, Jehovah Jireh in Genesis 22, and so that's where we put it. And now we're covering several more names, and I've put this one in Deuteronomy 5, but you can put it in any of the places where those uh, the references are. Does that make sense? And you might want to write on it, wherever you put it in your Bible, you might want to write a note that the previous one is in wherever you place the other one. Yeah, Does that make sense? And that way, and then the previous one, put where you're going to put this one. There's tape on the back table if you want to do that this evening. I'll feel free, but make that connection. And also, we do not cover all the names of God that you find in Scripture. This is not a, a conclusive list, but the ones that stick out as we study through. So just so you know, put that in your Bible, and you'll have that there. Um, and then last week, uh, we had an early class, before class, on uh, memorizing God's Word by heart uh, rather than rote memory. Um, and I know a lot of you were, were there. Did, were any of you able to put that into practice this week? Yeah. Cindy, yeah? Yeah? 
Uh, anybody want to share if that um, was that helpful? I should ask first. Was it helpful? <laughs> okay. Anybody want to share how that helped you? Um, I do the YouTube, um, mm -hmm. YouTube, you version Bible app, and that's how they did the scripture verse this week. Is they mm -hmm. took little sections. Just yeah. How you taught. Okay. To meditate and meditate on it. One phrase. Yeah. Yep. We call it phrase by phrase, day by day. Okay. And then they Interesting. Just a song so yeah. cool. They must have listened in on yeah, what we were. It was like interesting. <laughs> yeah. Good. I love it when people agree with what I say. Yes, yeah, Cindy. I ended up using it for journaling. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very helpful. The mm -hmm. things that I would meditated on, I, I journaled some great. phrases. So. Yeah. That has a great that impact, helpful. doesn't it? It's yeah. good for meditating like that. Yeah. Anybody else want to share? Give you a chance. Yes, Lori. I find that it it's in my heart more than it was before because mm -hmm. I'm really trying to take it such a bite at a time mm -hmm. and really anchoring it into my heart. Yeah, mm -hmm. good, yeah. good. Well, that is the focus, is to learn by heart rather than by mind. And most of the programs out there are focused on getting it into your mind. That's not where we want God's Word. We want it into our heart. So if you missed it, and this has uh, intrigued you enough, we are offering another one for those who were not... Uh, able to make it um, so if any of you want to sign up we can come early like next week I guess uh, 545 if anybody's interested um, is there anybody interested that we have one signed up I don't want to uh, I don't want to put anybody on the spot but we can do it again if you'd like to next week at 545 just be sure to let me know if you're interested in doing that does that make sense does that work if the time doesn't quite work we can we can alter that a little bit but um, it is a very helpful way to memorize God's Word and really get it to stick. So if you're interested, uh, let me know, and we'll plan on 545 next Tuesday, April 30th. All right? Okay, any questions on that? Are we good? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead. I think that's all our announcements. Let's go ahead and open in prayer this evening. Edie? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this night that we can come together and look at your word. And just pray that you would again open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits to you. And uh, may we learn how to walk with you more and more as we look at your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, in your home study, page 131 this week. It says Deuteronomy records Moses' last month on the earth. Isn't that interesting? It says his very last month, and he knows it. All right, with one month to live, Moses' concern is for these people who so frequently stray from God. Moses gives three speeches, calling them to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. In Exodus and Numbers, we saw the events. Here in Deuteronomy, we see the bigger picture as Moses reviews the events and gives more of God's view on them. The Israelites are now in the desert on the east side of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take possession of the land. Moses reminds them of the importance of trust and obedience to God, as shown from the bad example of their parents. And again, Moses is 120 years old as he delivers these speeches. And again, remember when God had told him that he was going to die, what was Moses' first concern? Who will lead the people? Right? It wasn't concern for his children or concern for his, his death or how he's going to die. It was who will lead these people, right? And this is what he focuses on in these last three speeches he makes to the Israelites. He wants them to understand the importance of following the Lord. So in your class notes, again, this is a training course, so we're going to talk about the title here for a minute. Uh, box one, the Greek title, Deuteronomy means second law or repetition of the law. The name came from the passage found in Deuteronomy 17, 18, where it says, make a copy of the law. However, as we have also seen in other books of Moses, this was not the original name, but was renamed at the time of the Greek translations. So the uh, original name of Genesis, and you have the Hebrew uh, spelling there, means in the beginning, right? We covered this before. And those are the first words of the book. We saw that the original name of Exodus, uh, in Hebrew, the name there, which means these are the names, the first words of the books. The original name of Leviticus was uh, the first words of the book, which means Jehovah called. 
And the original name of Numbers in Hebrew was Bemidbar, which means in the desert, from the first words of the book. Now, in English, uh, in the desert is not the first words of the book, but in Hebrew it is. And the original name of Deuteronomy also comes, guess from what? The first words of the book, right? Its original name, the Hebrew word there, which means these are the words. Now look at Deuteronomy 1.1. 1, 1. What does it say? These are the words. That was the original name of the, uh, the book here of Deuteronomy. So the original names for these books were sort of a memory prompt for the Israelites as they would memorize and recite the passages. So again, I think that's, that's brilliant. Um, let me give you one. For God so loved the world. There's your memory prompt, right? Mm -hmm. And so with the names of the books here too, that just saying the fierce for you words um, would remind them of what the rest said. And if you remember in that day, they didn't carry around their uh, leather bound Bible or hardcover Bible, right? And they didn't have their own copy, so they would memorize. They would meditate, right? They would learn it by heart. And so um, when you would say the first for few words of a passage, their mind would continue on to the rest of it, right? So often when Jesus quotes scripture, when we see him quote scriptures, we catch that part that he says, but the Jewish mind continues the thought. He says a few words and they would think of that whole context. Does that mean, does that make sense? They would continue the passage in their mind and they would know that bigger picture of what Jesus is saying. We find that uh, very interesting. We'll cover a little bit of that when we get to Matthew. And then in box two of your class notes, Deuteronomy contains four speeches Moses makes during the last month of his life. The first speech is the historical review of what God had done for Israel in the past. The second speech, what God expected of Israel now as they enter the land and live in the land, that's the present. The third speech is the blessings for obeying and curses for breaking the covenant with God. What will happen to them in the future if they don't follow him, right? And the fourth speech, renewal of the covenant and a look at their future. So Moses gives them a look at their past, present, and future as he admonishes them to follow the Lord. And you might want to write that information in your margin next to each speech or even at the start of Deuteronomy that there are four speeches and then divide them up in your margin there. So again, we've already uh, come to Deuteronomy several times while studying Exodus and Numbers. And so you should already have, if you've been marking your Bible, uh, was it fun coming and seeing that you already had some cross-references in there? You've already made those cross-ties there. And so um, take, uh, take the time to go back to the events as you, uh, as you come to them in your own study. And so as we read the speeches Moses gave to the Israelites, keep in mind that Moses at 120 years old is the oldest person there, right? His uh, own brother and sister who are older than him, they have both died now. And um, not only another little trivia thought on this is there was no other Israelite men his age. Not just his, as old as him, but his age. Why? What happened to all the Mis Israelite boys? Yeah, they, were, they died. So he's the only one his age from the very beginning since Pharaoh had killed him. But now, um, with the whole generation who has died, he is, uh, he's the oldest one. And so the next generation is 60 years old at the oldest, right? Because they're 20, uh, they had to be uh, 20 or younger. All those 20 and older died. They had to be younger. And so 60 years old is the oldest, except for two men. Who was it? Yeah, yeah. And they would be about 80 years old. Okay, so they're still kids compared to Moses here. But uh, let's go ahead and look at Moses' first speech. Uh, this is a historical review of what God had done uh, for Israel. So again, in Deuteronomy 1, we see the condensed version that Moses gives of their history. And um, it's just a summary of the events. There's a lot of things he doesn't bring out. Uh, that, that had happened. But he wants to remind this new generation where they come from and what God had done for them in order for them to have the proper respect, perspective, right? The proper fear of the Lord. And so again, try to, try to feel this on both sides. Um, the people know Moses is going to die. All right? How do you feel? Right? Their great leader is going to die. 
and he's not going to lead them in the land. And so they're listening carefully to everything he has to say. Does that make sense? And some of them weren't even born yet when some of these events happened. Some of them were. But he is retelling these things to them. And then from Moses' respect, uh, perspective, this is his last month. Can you imagine knowing this is his last month and thinking, what do I need to tell them? Mm -hmm. And, of course, God spoke through him as well and, and directed him. But um, this group who has constantly turned from the Lord, the previous generation and even now this generation, what has he got to tell them before he dies? So... Um, and remember, this generation grew up in the tents of their grumbling parents, right? So that's their perspective as well. And so he gives them a truthful look at their history. He wants to show them God's view, not just the events, but God's view of those events so that they're careful to follow him so they can have victory. So let's go ahead and start this evening with Deuteronomy 1 and read 1 through 3. These are the words that Moses spoke to all of Israel in the wilderness, east of the Jordan. That is the Araba, opposite Su, Su I don't know if that's an F sound, or whatever, between Paran and Tapos, Laban, Hazaroth, you know why no one picked this one, um, <laughs> Dizaham. Diza um, it takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kaddish, um, Barana, no, Barana, by the Mount Seir Road. In the fourth year, on the first day of the eleventh month, Moses proclaimed to all the Israelites that all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. Okay, so again, as we've covered before, it took eleven days in verse two, eleven days to go from Mount Sinai, where God had gave them, given them the law, to Kadesh Barnea. So if you haven't already circled the word eleven there, I've underlined it and circled it. And then in verse 3, he jumps down in the 40th year. Okay, it takes 11 years. There's 11 days. It took them 40 years. All right, so circle the 40th year. All right, so the 11-day trip took 40 years. Now, literally, it took 38, as we found out last week, right? Because God just added the two previous years they'd already been following him into their uh, counted towards their penalty. And so uh, they have been following the Lord for the whole 40 years, but there is a 38-year gap. So if you didn't uh, know that before, be sure to get the information in your Bible so that you can explain it with the cross-references that tell us that. So again, 38 years uh, we covered. They're wandering last in our last lesson. It's a sad reminder to the people of the cost of unbelief, right? They were right there, ready to take it but their unbelief kept them out. So this generation standing there is uh, listening to Moses would have grown up in the land if their parents had followed the Lord in, right? They'd have had 38 years now living in the land, growing their crops, settling the land. Um, so Moses is going to remind this generation of this, that it was the unbelief of their parents of the previous generation and the penalty that came from it, and he's going to challenge them to follow the Lord. Don't make the mistakes their parents made, right? Follow the Lord. So in your class notes, box 3, Deuteronomy 1, 2 through 3, the 11-day trip took 40 years or 38. It was not the distance. It was the condition of their hearts, the distance in their relationship with God. Isn't that true? Right. So trust and obedience were needed for following uh, the Lord. And again, remember the problems were very real. They were huge, Okay. Um, they were life-threatening problems. So I don't want to diminish what they faced in any way. They were life-threatening problems. Don't underestimate that. And humanly speaking, they had great reason to fear and doubt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it showed their unbelief mm -hmm. in what God had told them to do. So put it on that level in your own life, right? That trust in spite of life-threatening situations, right? in spite of huge things. Um, and again, there's a path that God wants to take us, and we say, oh, it's too hard, or I don't understand, or I'm afraid, I'm uncomfortable with this, right? Mm -hmm. And we make trouble for ourselves, right? And we may even wander around for a while looking for an easier path. Isn't that human nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And theirs was so much more there. So again, following God may seem hard, but it is nothing. Here's the key to learn. 
Following God may seem hard, but it is nothing compared to not following Him. Right? And the confusion and the problems that that caused. All right. So Moses showed them the folly of not following God as their parents had chosen. Their parents chose the easy way, the safe way, right? And wandered the rest of their life until they died. Yeah. So in Deuteronomy 1.4, we see the names uh, of two of the kings uh, Israel defeated, and we had covered these in Numbers. So uh, in your class notes box uh, 4 and 5, you can next to Deuteronomy 1.4, you can reference back to Numbers 21, 23 through 26. There's the king of Sihon, of Heshbon, and then in box five, uh, we see King Odd of Bash, uh, Bashan. And so let's go ahead and read um, verse four and five. You can get your cross references there. This was after he had defeated Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon. And at the Edria had defeated Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth, east of the Jordan in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law saying. So, okay, so they're on your, on your uh, map there. They are east, uh, they're east of the Jordan River, uh, just north of Moab. See, here's Moab. They're just north of Moab at the Jordan River right across from Jericho. All right, so this is where they're, uh, where Moses gives uh, these speeches to them. Okay, and so uh, the NIV said uh, Moses, let's see what, uh, in verse, the end of verse 5, Moses began to expound this law, okay, and um, the King James uh, says that he began to declare the law, um, but the word here actually means to dig, to engrave, to make clear. So he went over God's word, he went over their history to make it very clear so they understand. Right? He wasn't having a, um, you know, a dusty, old, boring lecture of their past and they're taking notes. Right? He, is, he wants them to understand this. He is having them dig deep and engrave it on their minds to make it plain and clear. So it's a little bit stronger wording than what we have in English here. And um, he's digging deep to give them what they need to know. And he's going to review 40 years of history covering their travel and God's law that he gave him. And um, they need to know how to follow the Lord, right, as he brings them into the land. So let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8. The Lord our God said to us, the Lord, you have stayed long enough at, at this mountain. Great camp and advance into the hill country of Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in Araba, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the cave, and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon. As far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have given you the land. Go and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to the descendants after them. Okay, so you can highlight what the Lord says there. At um, In red, Moses is uh, retelling this. But in verse 6, it says, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb. Okay, in your class notes. Now, what do we know about Horeb? It's the same thing as Mount Sinai, okay? So that's interchangeable. So on your class notes, box six, in Deuteronomy, Moses refers to Mount Horeb, which is also called Mount Sinai. They're the same place and referred to interchangeably throughout the account. In Exodus 3, 1, the Lord first appeared to Moses at Mount Horeb. In Exodus 19, 2 to 3, we see they arrive at the desert of Sinai. In Exodus 19, 20, the Lord descended on Mount Sinai. So again, write the, that information in your margin to, uh, to clear up any confusion that you might have. All right, so let's read uh, verses 9 through 13. At that time I said to you, you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. The Lord your God has increased your numbers so that today you are as numerous as the stars in the sky. May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. But how can I bear your problems and your burdens and your disputes all by myself? Choose some wise, understanding, and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will set them over you. 
So um, again, he says you're numerous as the uh, stars in the sky. And so again, referring back, now that is an expression. It's not the exact number of stars, right? Don't go and do a, a census of all the Israelites that ever lived um, to know how many stars there are. That's an expression that comes, uh, God had told them way back in uh, Genesis 15, 5. Let's look that up. Genesis 15, 5. And the rest references are in box 7 here. Genesis 15, 5. What did God say to Abraham? He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Okay, and if you remember, the Lord said that to Abraham before he had had any children. Mm -hmm. Right? So again, just blown away with that visual. And what a great visual God gave him because every single night as he goes and looks at the stars, what is he remembering? You know, God's promise to him. And then let's look up Hebrews 11, verse 12, page 1881. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the, as the sand in the seashore. Okay, so the expression there. So let's uh, look at box 7 there in your class notes. Uh, next to Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 13, you can reference those two that we just looked up. Moses refers to them as being as numerous as the stars in the sky. It's an expression to show that they have greatly multiplied rather than an exact fact. So I find this interesting that um, Moses says in verse uh, 6, or I mean, I'm sorry, in verse 9, he says, uh, At that time I said to you, you're too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. And then um, he just kind of, he skips a few details there, doesn't he, in the retelling? He doesn't tell them um, that he... Um, the reason they had uh, judges appointed is that um, he had cried out to the Lord in great frustration because of their constant complaining and sin. He kind of left that out of the account here. Okay, get your cross-reference in and you'll see what they were doing. And he was so frustrated with their constant complaining and rebellion. And so uh, the Lord had him do this uh, to help him. So in box 8 is your cross-reference back to Numbers 11. And let's turn back there and we'll read a portion of it. Numbers 11, let's read 10 through 17. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you? And you put the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Mm -hmm. Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me seventy of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders, officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting so they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that's on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you won't have to carry it alone. Okay, that's pretty much what he said in Deuteronomy, right? Uh, there's one phrase at least, the burden is too heavy for me, right? That's the one phrase that made it over into Deuteronomy. Um, but again, Moses is going, and we talked about that when we were there. He's not whining and complaining. He has really good reason to be this frustrated. And so the Lord meets his need, right? Um, but in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses' goal in this speech is not to go over every wrongdoing the previous generation did, right? He's not going to point out all the faults and the sins they committed. He's just giving this generation the brief history lesson so they'll understand where they stand now, okay? So this is not a gripe session for Moses, right? It's to instruct and, and um, encourage and edify them. So in this account, he merely explains briefly why they have judges, why there are judges appointed and what their requirements are. Does that make sense? Because what they know now is that there's judges. Well, how did they get there? So he's just giving this brief synopsis so they'll understand not only why they have uh, judges among them, 
but what the requirements are that they need to carry from this point forward. This is not a volunteer basis, right? There's some requirements. And so Deuteronomy 1, 14 through 18, he tells the requirements. Let's go ahead and read that, 14 through 18. You answered me, what you propose to do is good. So I took the leading men of your tribes, wise and respected men, and appointed them to have authority over you as commanders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and as tribal officials. And as I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly, whether the case is between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Do not show partiality in judging. Hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Bring me any case too hard for you, and I will hear it. And at that time, I told you everything you were to do. Okay, so he's giving them the qualifications. Now in verse 13, uh, you, can, you can circle what, what was the requirement. Wise, understanding, and respected men, right? And then the requirements of what they need to do. They need to judge fairly, not show favoritism, not show partiality. Not fear anyone in their judgment because God is the real judge. So again, it's not volunteer. It's not even voting for, right? They need to meet these requirements. And so um, in verse uh, 18 there, Moses says, At that time I told you everything you were to do. Um, you can circle the word you if you want. Um, none of those judges he appointed are still alive. Okay? And so when Moses... Uh, gives this speech. So Moses is telling them this because of their history and they can refer back to this account to know what the requirements are in choosing more judges. Does that make sense? But he uses the word you because this applies to them, right? As they choose uh, in the future, this is the requirements that are, uh, that they must have. It's their history. They can refer back to the book in the book of Bemidbar, right? Which book is that? Test time. Numbers. Numbers. It, the original name is Bemidbar. Uh, becomes uh, the book of Numbers. They, they have that. They can look back and see. And so he's reminded them there um, that they're to read and memorize and live by. So the new judges that have been appointed in this next generation need to follow those requirements. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Now he's going to die. And so they might just do a whole different thing. And so he's taking them back to God's word and what he has required. Yes, Sarah. What you are we supposed to circle? What? What? In, in verse 18. In 18, you. So he's saying you, even though it was the previous generation. Does that make sense? He's saying you, Israel, even though these people were not uh, involved in that at the time, and those judges. Uh, he just makes it personal for them. Does that make sense? Okay. So they need to continue to follow what God had instructed the previous generation. Let's read verses uh, Deuteronomy 1, 19 through 21. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. And so we reached Kadesh Barnea. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Okay, so again, remember, keep in mind, I mean, we've already covered all this, right? So it's, it's now we're past all that. That generation is fully, uh, has passed away. All of them had died, and he's telling this new generation um, of when they came to the door there from Mount Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. So in your class notes, box 9, is your cross-reference to put next to Deuteronomy uh, 119. It refers back to Numbers 10. And so let's go ahead back to Numbers 10 and read the actual account that he's referring to. Numbers 10, verses 11 and 12. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. Okay, the Desert of Paran. Remember we covered this uh, last, um, last week. And then let's read Numbers 10, 33 through 34. So they set out from the mountains of the Lord and traveled for three days. 
The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them during the, those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day, and when they set out from the camp. Okay. All right. So again, this is referring back to that time. But um, in his speech here in Deuteronomy, Moses again skips over the sins and the consequences, right, of what went on uh, that we saw in Numbers 11. Uh, he skips the whole Numbers 11 thing um, when their parents again rebelled against the Lord only three days into their journey, right? He doesn't go into all of that here. He also skips the disheartening account of his own brother and sister rising against him in Numbers 12. None of that's mentioned here in Deuteronomy, okay? So he simply tells them that they traveled uh, from Horeb to Kadesh through the wilderness. Isn't that interesting? So you see the condensed version as he's just keeping them uh, on track here. Let's read Deuteronomy 1, 22 through 25. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkol and explored it, taking with them some of the fruit of the land. They brought it down to us and reported, it is a good land that the Lord, our God, is giving us. Okay. So, um, again, I think we covered this back when we were in Numbers, but here in Deuteronomy 1.22, uh, Moses says um, that uh, all of you came and said to me, let's send men ahead to spy the land, okay? Um, so that the people came and said they wanted to spy the land. However, look back at Numbers 13. Keep your finger there. Look back at Numbers 13.1. Who does it say? Told Moses? The Lord. The Lord. So in Numbers 13, 1, it says the Lord told him to send spies. And here in Deuteronomy 1, it says the people came to him. Is that a, is that a, a discrepancy? Mm. No, it's probably uh, goes along with the character. Again, uh, we already found out Moses isn't telling everything that happened, right? It's not mm -hmm. a duplicate uh, account here. So it probably, um, what happened is the two accounts uh, do not contradict each other. In Numbers, Moses gives the information that the Lord was the one who determined to have them do it, okay? But it seems that the people wanted it done, and so they come to Moses, and then what would have Moses had done with that request? He would have asked the Lord, right? Is that the pattern we've seen so far? Isn't it cool knowing God's word in context all the way through so we see what his normal uh, habit of doing? So he would have inquired of the Lord as he was in the habit of doing, and the Lord gave the command. It fits perfectly with what we've seen of Moses all along. Does that make sense? And so the two accounts do not contradict each other. He's just giving the um, simplified uh, version here. And the interesting thing is, it probably was the people's idea. He pro they probably did say, let's send spies in. Why do they need spies? The Lord's given them the land. Why do they need to go confirm what the Lord has said, right? But, again, in their doubt, they wanted it, and the Lord said, sure. And so he commands it here. But in your class notes, box 10 there, next to Deuteronomy 122, you can reference back to Numbers 13, 1 through 3. Moses gives different details of the same event. The people had asked to spy out the land. Moses took it before the Lord. The Lord commanded it to be done. And so, again, make a note in your margin to show that it's not a contradiction. But And then in verse 24, uh, mentions the Valley of Eshkol. Uh, do anybody remember what that means? Cluster. cluster. Yeah, because it was there that they found the cluster of grapes, and um, we saw that it took two people, right, to carry one cluster of grapes. And we had this picture uh, last time as well. And this is a modern day cluster of grapes from that area. So they still produce uh, one of the world's leading. Um, producers of grapes. Isn't that interesting? I tried to bring the biggest grapes I could tonight, but that's, uh, I could only get them, you know, I couldn't find that big of a cluster. And they taste good. And yeah, they are, aren't they? Yeah. So, all right, so class notes box uh, 11 there is your cross references uh, for the cluster of grapes there. And then in your home study, um, Deuteronomy 1, 26 through 28, Moses tells about the response of the previous generation had 
to the report from the spies and their outcry and rebellion against the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 1, let's read, um, I'll read a 26, uh, and you can highlight in gray if you want, or underline in gray. So up in verse 25, um, it's a good land that the Lord your God has given us, but you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. All right, so can you kind of hear Moses' frustration even in the retelling? Mm -hmm. And remember, all of those people that said that, they have died already in the desert. But what does he say? He says, you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled. Again, he is giving them their history so they do not repeat those same mistakes. Does that make sense? They need to personalize this, just like they were to personalize the Passover. Every year from that point on, they would say it's when the Lord led us out of Egypt. Even if it's hundreds of years later, they would personalize it. And Moses is having them personalize this as well. So again, his frustration in the retelling here. Um, some of them standing there remember this. They were young at the time, but they would remember their parents' reaction to the report, all those under 20, um, and the rebellion and the punishment that came from it. So in your uh, class notes, box 12 is your cross-reference uh, there for that. You can get that in. So they were unwilling to obey the Lord. They rebelled against him. See the words? You can circle unwilling, rebelled, grumbled. Hear all those good words there? And they thought the Lord hated them after all he had done for them along the path. They thought he hated them even though they were his treasured possession. Either attitude here. So this was the previous generation response. And again, um, their parents' hearts uh, uh, were hard. They didn't understand God's love and his protection and his leading. They didn't understand that he allowed them to have problems so that they would grow and learn to trust him, right? Isn't that a lesson for us as well? Don't you wish we had no problems? Then we'd never grow, right? And the interesting thing about problems is it really does help us see where we're at in our walk. And if you have not thus far in life had any problems, you will, you will. So life, I don't know, does life get easier and easier? No. no. If we don't learn from the problems of today, how are we ever going to stand in the problems of tomorrow, right? They never did. They always grumbled. They didn't grow. Lesson for life for us. It shows us where our walk with the Lord is, where our trust is. And so some of the hardships they had faced was because of their sin, right? They faced a lot more hardships than was necessary because it was also punishment. But some of their hardships was an opportunity for them to grow and to seek the Lord. Uh, but they never understood. They never learned. They just grumbled. And they made their lives miserable, but they also made their children's lives miserable, right? Our sins affect those around us as well. So box 13, lesson for life. The previous generation never learned from their trials. They complained and rebelled. And James tells us how to view hardships and trials. And if you have not memorized this yet, this is a life verse to memorize. Let's look this up. James 1, 2 through 4. It's page 1886. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of it many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That perseverance finishes its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Okay, and then it goes on from there. Just memorize that whole passage. If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. So again, our view of hardships, and it says consider it pure joy, that means undiluted, just absolute joy and nothing else, right? Is that what the Israelites had? Absolute joy at their troubles and nothing else, right? That's what James says we should have. It should be that whole, wow, this is a real big problem. I wonder what God's going to do in this. I wonder how much I'm going to grow, right? 
That's what he encourages us to do. Because, and it's not just joy because of the trial, it's because we know we're going to grow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But they never did. Growing is actually optional, right? So watch yourself. So again, do we really understand it? Do we live it? Um, and so again, trials in our life, um, part of them is because we live in a fallen world. Part of them is because of sin. Part of them is because our sin or others' sin or just, right, Satan's rule here. But part of it is, um, and I think in all of it, part of it is to, for us to grow through them regardless, right? And that's exciting when you can see God's hand in it and when we handle the situation right. Um, that's exciting to see our growth. So, um, just a lesson for life there that they never understood. And so we need to have the right uh, focus. We have these examples here uh, for us uh, and clear instructions through his word. And we have the Holy Spirit, right? They didn't. Can you maybe now forgive them a little bit more? They didn't even have the Holy Spirit. Remember when, when uh, God put his Holy Spirit on those others? And Joshua was upset. Moses stopped them, right? What was Moses' response? I wish everyone had the Spirit of God in them. Then they would act like Moses in faith and obedience, right? That's the challenge for us. If we've surrendered him, we do have that Spirit. We have nothing, we, we can have nothing but pure joy when we face our trials. Does that make sense? Once we understand that. Moses is refocusing their eyes here on God. And um, again, keep that in mind because all they've heard is the grumbling and complaining of their um, parents about the hardships from their parents. And uh, the other thing, you know, a few weeks ago we saw the layout of the camp and saw that the, uh, with as many people, almost three million people, that it would have covered like a 12 square miles. Um, so they didn't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Moses. Who did they learn from? their parents in their tents, right? And those grumbling around them. And so again, Moses has given them a clear view here. Let's read Deuteronomy 1, 29 through 31. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you, as he did for you in Egypt, before your very eyes, and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as the Father carries his son, all the way you went until you reached this place. Okay, in your home study, uh, it says, notice how Moses described God's involvement. So Moses is getting their eyes back on God here and what he has said. God's going to go before them. God did go before them. He's going to continue to go before them. He fought for them. And isn't that, isn't that cool? He carried them as a father carries his son. Isn't that cool? And all they did is complain, right? <laughs> All right, so Moses is showing them God's character through all of this. Um, and God doesn't go against his character. He loves them. He's called them out. Um, and they keep forcing his discipline, right, by their character. All right, so let's read Deuteronomy 1, 32 through 36. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God, who went ahead of you on your journey, in fire by night and in a cloud by the day, to search our places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. When the Lord heard that you said he was angry and soundly swore, no one from the evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your ancestors. So Caleb, son of Jephunneh, he will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Okay, so you can uh, circle Caleb there if you want to. Um, as he stands out, and what does he stand out for? You can highlight in green, he followed the Lord wholeheartedly, right? Okay, so again, as Moses says this to the people, now as we said before, he's saying, you, you did this, you did this, and, and most of them weren't there, right? Most all of the people that had committed that sin had died, but he's making it very personal. But he says, except Caleb, and Caleb's still standing right there, right? And so um, he's living, literally living proof that God keeps his word, right? While the others had a greater fear of the enemy than fear of the Lord, Caleb followed the Lord despite the fear, despite the danger, despite the giants, as it says. So he had the proper fear of the Lord. He had the right view of God. And what was the result? All the others have died. 
and Caleb standing there ready to go in and take the land 38 years later. Okay, so box 14 there is your cross-reference on all of that. And Caleb had the right view of the Lord and followed him wholeheartedly. And our lesson for life in box 15, what could we possibly fear except fear going our own way instead of his way? Fear him and you need fear nothing else. And this generation needed to know this. And again, Caleb's standing right there among them. Um, and they're about to go in the land. And guess what? The enemy hasn't changed. They're going to see the same things the previous generation saw, right? The cities are still fortified. The people are still big. The armies are more powerful than them, exactly what their parents had seen. They're going to face, be faced with the same exact decisions their parents had to face. All right? So they need to not fear man, but rather fear disobeying the Lord. Let's read Deuteronomy 137 through 40. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, You shall not enter it either, but your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him, because he will lead us, lead Israel to inherit it. And the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around and set out toward the desert along the road of, to the Red Sea. Okay. And again, Moses is quoting God here, but you can highlight it in uh, red. And so he blames them, right? Moses blames them for him not being able to go into the land. Um, they had pushed him to the limit, right? Um, and again, you can hear his frustration and regret. Um, because he's the one who was called by God over in Midian to go and rescue the Israelites and lead them into the promised land. But was it their fault that the Lord didn't let him in? No, it was his own sin, right? It was his own mm -hmm. sin there. And so, again, in his frustration here, he, he spent the extra 38 years leading these disobedient people, right? And now he doesn't get to enter the land. Um, and so now he's led them back full circle all the way back to Kadesh, uh, ready for the next generation to uh, go in and conquer the land if they will follow the Lord. Um, and so you can kind of understand why Moses blamed him, but blamed them. But again, as we uh, saw in Numbers 20, their sin did not permit him to sin, right? And that's a key lesson for us as well. Yes. It's his own sin that God brought God's uh, penalty on him. So in box 16, there's your class reference, or your cross reference back to numbers to the account. And then there in, in Deuteronomy 139, Moses uh, retells what God said about the previous generation's children. And he's speaking, as he's speaking about the little ones that you said would be taken captive, he's talking to that generation right there. Those little ones have now grown up, right? And they are the ones who will enter the land. And so Moses is reminding them that their parents' fears were invalid. They were afraid for their children, right? Can you understand that, moms? Right? Very afraid for their children. Is God's arm too short to take care of them, right? And so now their children have grown up and will enter the land that their parents rejected because of their fear for their children. Make sense? And, and the fear of the enemy there. So in box uh, 17, Oh, your cross-references regarding that, regarding their concerns for their children there. So just another little lesson for life. Can God take care of our children? Right? And I believe that God raises up our children at just the right time. I've heard you know, so many people say that it's a bad time to raise children, but the way the world is, it's the perfect time to raise children. It's exactly when God wants them in this generation to do the work he's called them to do, right? Let's not be guilty of making uh, the same mistake they did there. Oh, God can handle that. Let's read Deuteronomy 1, 41 through 44. Then you replied, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight as the Lord our God commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it easy to go up in the hill to, into the hill country. But the Lord said to me, Tell them, Do not go up and fight, because I will not be with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. So I told you, but you would not listen. You rebelled against the Lord's command, and in your arrogance you marched into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in those 
hills came out against you. They chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down from Seir all the way to Horma. All right, and you read it with his attitude there, I think, yeah. Um, and so again, he's just remembering what they had done 38 years earlier, right? God had given the penalty, fine. You uh, wanna die, you wish you'd died in the desert, that's exactly what you're gonna do. So for 38 years, they just wait until all of them die. And so, but, but when they realize what the penalty is, what did they do? They said, oh, oh just kidding, just yeah, kidding. We'll, yeah, we'll go yeah, do it yeah, now, yeah, right? Yeah. So they tried to please God by disobeying him again. Right? And so their arrogance, the rebellion, God did not listen to them. And so Moses is reminding this generation so they'll set their hearts to listen intently and follow what the Lord commands, not to go ahead of him. So there's your uh, cross references in um, box one on page 134. So just a lot of cross references back to what we've already uh, covered here. And then in box two, your lessons for life. If we are not following God, we should not be surprised by the chaos, chaos and trouble that results from following our own path. It is impossible to please God unless we follow him. God does not follow us. We are to follow him. Ask God to lead you and then follow and obey him. And how can we know what God wants? Right? Through his word. It's through his word that we know. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1. Then we turned back and set out toward the wilderness around the route to the Red Sea, as the Lord had directed me. For a long time, we made our way around the hill country of Seir. Okay, so for a long time. You can write in your margin, 38 years. Okay, and so Moses just sums up their 38 years of, uh, of their punishment here. He sums it up as a long time. And then let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 2, 2 through 6. Then the Lord said to me, You have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. Give the people these orders. You are about to pass through the territory of your relatives, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. They will be afraid of you, but be very careful. Do not provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land not even enough to put your foot on. I have even or I have given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. You are to pay them in silver for the food you eat and the water you drink. Okay, so he is quoting uh, the Lord here again, so you can highlight in red. But in verse three, so Moses had Moses had said in uh, in verse one there, for a long time we made our way, and that's thirty eight years. And then he quotes the Lord that says, you've made your way around this hill country long enough. You can circle that as well. And that's 38 years, which was possibly a surprise to Moses because he's counting the days and they've got two more years, right? Because the penalty was 40 years. And the Lord says, that's long enough, right? He adds the two years of where they were at the mountain there. And so again, we see God's mercy in this. He chops off two years of their sentence and credits their first two years of following him as part of that. Isn't that interesting? So uh, underline what Moses says, long time, and then what the Lord says, long enough, and I've got lines drawn out to my margin, said 38 years. So we see God's mercy in there. And here the Lord had told them not to provoke Edom to war. Uh, why were they not to provoke the Edomites? He'd given them the land because they're descendants of Esau. All right. And so they are not to attack them. Um, and so they were to be very careful how they conducted themselves. And then in Numbers 20, uh, we saw that they had written a letter to the king of Edom, remember? And asked to pass through on the main road on the king's highway, which was the main road through the countries there. Um, but he refused to let them pass. And so what did they do? They had to go all the long way around the southern boundary of Edom, adding to their journey um, significantly. And so, uh, your class notes box uh, three has your uh, cross references there, so be sure to get those in. Why and do you suppose he gave them land so close to each other? Was that to provoke them or to see if they would mind them? With, um, with the Edomites, my big map here tonight um, we covered this last week, I think. 
Um, but the um, they had been over here in Kadesh Barnea. So Canaan, this is all the land they're going to take over. The Lord's not giving them Edom. Uh, Edom, the Edomites had already settled in that land. We read way back in uh, Genesis that they'd settled. They're not uh, allowed to fight Edom nor Moab because Moab are his descendants of Lot. Very good. So the land that they're going into, uh, Mary, is actually they're going to come up here and cross over into the Jordan and take this land over here. Oh, okay. so got, Does that make sense? They've got the now borders. what they do end up doing is taking over the land north of Moab on the uh, east side of Jordan. Okay. But the land God has promised them was over here. Uh, so other nations already live in these other, um, and again, it's hilly and mountainous and all that, so they have um, some separation there. But does that answer your so, question a yeah, little so bit? so it's not just like yeah. right close and there's right. like the China Wall is just so yeah. <laughs> yeah, they would have had uh, space between them there, yeah. And again, the King's Highway went through all of these countries. There were several main roads during uh, that time. There was a main road that went from Egypt up to, we covered this way back in, in Exodus, main road from Egypt up through uh, to along the Mediterranean Sea, which is probably the route they expected to take. Uh, and in, for those roads, um, people from all over the world there would travel on those roads, okay? But Edom doesn't want them to pass through because they've heard what God has done to Egypt, right? And they don't want the same thing done to them. So they have to go around here. But um, and there in box four is uh, talking about Lot's descendants, uh, the Moabites. And so uh, that's in Deuteronomy 2 down in verse 9. We haven't read that, have we? No. Uh, let's look at verse 9 and then 19. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass the Moabites and provoke them to war, or I will not give you any part of their land. I have already given our to the descendants of Lot as a possession. And then 19. When you come to the Amorites, do not harass them or provoke them to war, for I will not give you possession of any land belonging to the Ammonites, I have given it as a possession to the descendants of Lot. Okay, so again, Moses is just in the shortened version reminding them of these things so that they would remember not to attack uh, the Edomites or the Moabites. We did see that Moab uh, wanted to, oh, did end up, let's see, they were judged with uh, the king Balak and Balaam. We saw that last year. Um, or last year. Wow! <laughs> My brain's gone in too many different directions. I gotta, I gotta reel it in here. Okay. Okay. Um, so they did have some problems with Moab, but the Lord commanded them not to uh, harass them. And then we see in uh, verse or ten, yeah, the Edom, the Emites used to live there. People strong and numerous, and as tall as the Anakites. Like the Anakites, they too were considered Raphaites, but the Moabites called them Emites. All right, you got all that. Um, so what we find out is that um, uh, in verse 20, do, do you have a different, uh, Melissa, did verse 10 and 11 say anything different than Raphaites um, to you? The Emim had dwelt there in the times past, the people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. Okay, all right. Um, some of the translations, well, this is in class notes box five, um, Raphaites often translated as giants. Yep. Now, the King James often does that as giants, um, and we've talked about this before. And then down in verse 20, uh, that too was considered a land of Raphaites who used to live there. Now, mine does say giants in 20. Okay, interesting. Okay, so that is um, actually a, a misquote of the word um, gigantus, uh, and it actually means fearsome ones. It's not saying giants like the word we do, but they took the Hebrew word gigantus and said, oh, that's giants uh, because they're tall. But um, it's not the same. And uh, we need to keep in mind that what we consider giants today from our fairy tales, right, we've covered this before, is not what they're talking about. Um, I think I told you this story before. We were down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and my husband and I were staying in a hotel, and we got on an elevator, and there was already people on the elevator, and they were from the uh, uh, visiting team of basketball. Oh, yeah, wow. and we got on. Now, I'm 5'2", so I'm used to going like this to people. I do that to my husband, you know. But he's 6'2", and I don't see him do that very often. 
but he's sitting there looking <laughs> up at these, right, they were giants, right? And um, they could pat our head down here. They were just so very tall. So that's more of the feeling or the idea of the giants here that we felt very small uh, among them. But again, uh, in 1 Samuel 17, we saw Goliath. How tall was Goliath? Just, just over nine feet tall, okay, which is pretty tall, right? But still not, uh, not like our fairy tales. And then let's jump ahead to Deuteronomy 3. Uh, interesting little note here. Deuteronomy 3, verse 11, tells us about Og, king of Bashan, was the last of these Raphites, or what is translated giants. His bed was decorated with iron and was more than nine cubits long, four cubits wide, and so that is 14 feet long. Okay, now a bed is taller than a person, right? So he was definitely um, shorter uh, than that. And he's the last of these uh, tall people, the fearsome ones. And so again, you think about that, they, they were tall, and that's pretty fearful um, to see such tall people. But it's not all that unusual today. Just a little trivia here. Uh, here's some tall people today. All right, you see this? So again, um, I had to look up what's the tallest people uh, living today, even in our generation. So um, back in um, 1918 to 40, we have the man who's eight foot 11. So he was just uh, shorter, a little shorter than uh, Goliath. And then this one here in the middle, uh, eight feet nine inches. And down in uh, 1897, so not uh, to 1921, he actually lived to 1921. Isn't that cute? That's a family photo of him and his parents. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> All right, and he's uh, uh, eight foot uh, four inches here. And um, let's see, another one here is more modern day. There we go. So this one is from uh, 1982, Turkish farmer, um, eight foot, uh, two inches, almost three inches. Okay, so it's not unheard of, right, to have really tall people. Now again, with these people, this is unnatural. They have a defect where they don't stop growing. Does that make sense? And the people back here were tall and strong and mighty, okay? But again, when we think of giants, we think of, you know, we come up knee high to them or something, right? And it's not unheard of to have large people, especially early in history like that. Does that make sense? So it's just kind of a little trivia to say it's not uh, so far out of reach um, that these are tall people. But um, in your home study, again, here, um, Deuteronomy 2.7, Moses points out God's love and protection, even in this time of their punishment. So again, just as he's going through this, let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 2, 7. The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you and has not, and you have not lacked anything. Okay. And so in spite of the rebellion and the penalty for it, God still blessed them in every way, all those years. And again, Moses is reminding this new group as they're standing, hearing him tell this, God has met all their needs, even in their time of punishment. He's been right there for him. And then next in your home study, it said, compare this truth with Deuteronomy 2, 14 through 15. What characteristics of God do we learn? Let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 2, 14 and 15. Thirty-eight years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zered Valley. By then, the entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp, as the Lord had sworn to them. The Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. Are those two seemingly opposite characteristics of God? Not really. They go hand in hand because it all comes from his holiness, right? As we talked about. So, um, 38 years wandering until that generation of fighting men died, the Lord's hand is against them, right? He provided everything they needed. He had love and compassion for them, and his hand was against them, all right? That fits under God's holiness. So, he loved them, provided, and dealt with their sin. Does that make sense? All right, so in your uh, class notes, box six there, God is compassionate, 
but he does not leave the guilty unpunished. We need to have the whole picture of who God is. Some see just his judgment and some see just his love. Both are an incomplete picture and lead to wrong understanding. We need to see the whole of who God is so we'll follow him wholeheartedly. God had said in Numbers 14, 23, no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see the land. Now here in Deuteronomy 2, 14, we see that it has come true. Not one of them is still alive. So again, add this, uh, these things to the characteristics of God uh, sheet because you have to have the two characteristics of God here. He loved them, he blessed them, he provided for them. Remember, their, their clothes didn't wear out, their feet didn't swell. Isn't that amazing? And yet they're facing their penalty and all of them will die that had rejected him. Okay? So again, um, he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. And what if he did? What if God's love and compassion allowed him to leave the guilty unpunished? Where would we be today, right? Why follow him? Why obey him, right? It would not be just. It would not be just. Yeah. It, we would not want that in our own country for the judge to just be loving and kind and forgive all the trespasses, right? So God is uh, just. He isn't an indulgent father who looks the other way, right? He loves us enough to deal with sin. Does that make sense? Can you get wrap your mind around those two characteristics? They fit together. And to understand, as we talked about before, that it all comes out of holiness, so his judgments are holy. Uh, he's always right, and his compassion is holy. Um, and again, all through that time, they still had bread raining from heaven every day, right? Meeting all their needs. Okay, and so in your class notes, box 7 is your cross-reference uh, for that uh, reference back to Numbers 14, uh, 23, where we see God's promised punishment, that none of them would enter the land. Um, and then let's read Deuteronomy 2, 16 through 18. Now when the last of these fighting men among the people had died, the Lord said to me, Today you are to pass by the region of Moab at Ar. When you come to the Ammonites, do not harass them or provoke them to war, for I will not give you possession of any land belonging to the Ammonites. I have given it as a possession to the descendants of Lot. Okay, so once all of them had died, what does the Lord say? Today. We're leaving today. So circle the word. As soon as the punishment is over, the Lord's ready to lead them into uh, the promise. And again, they're just standing around waiting for the last one to die. Then they have a funeral, and then they pack up and leave, right? Because the punishment is done now. And so the Lord leads them out. So again, this was just a pause in God's plan due to their sin. The penalty's over, and now they can move forward right where they left off. And again, we covered all of this uh, in Numbers. But... Because of their disobedience, none of them will enter the land that were over 20 here. Um, but also, because of their disobedience, all those wicked people in Canaan lived an additional 38 years, continuing deeper and deeper in their wickedness. See the rippling effect? Um, how many people suffered because of that sin, uh, the delay? So in your um, home study, as before, God is going to fight their battles for them. Notice what he did. Uh, let's read Deuteronomy 2, 25. This very day I will begin to put the terror and fear of you on all the nations under heaven. They will hear reports of you and will tremble and will be in anguish because of you. Okay, you can circle that. He'll put the terror and the fear. Remember, he had said he was going to send his hornet ahead. Um, and so again, God's at work. The Israelites are afraid of the fortified cities and the big Canaanites and their armies, but God's sending his fear ahead uh, so that they are already trembling. Um, they will lose heart before Israel even gets there. All right, and this is how they can conquer nations much greater than themselves. Deuteronomy 2, uh, 26 through 27. From the desert of Hedemoth, I sent messengers to Sihon, king of Heshbon, offering peace and saying, let us pass through your country we will stay on the main road. We will not turn aside to the right or to the left. Okay. So I don't know if that's clear enough or not. But uh, Heshman is right here. And so let's see. 26 says, um, 
from the desert there. They sent messengers. Um, okay, and then let's read 30 through 33. Sihon, king of Heshbon, refused to let us pass through. For the Lord your God had made his spirit stubborn and his heart obstinate in order to give them into your hands as he has now done. The Lord said to me, See, I have begun to deliver Sihon and his country over to you. Now begin to conquer and possess his land. When Sihon and all his army came out to meet us in battle at Jahaz, the Lord our God delivered him over to us struck him down together with his sons and his whole Okay, so while they were down here, again, I'm not sure how well you can see, but they're down here, they send word up to him up in Heshbon, all right, to say, uh, to pass through. And then he comes down and meets them here and battles with them over here. So again, they're still over here just north of Moab. And so this is where this takes place. Um, and then uh, they offered peace to Sihon, uh, to Sihon um, but um, it says in verse 30, the Lord your God has made his spirit stubborn and his heart obstinate. Now, have we heard something like this before with Pharaoh? Okay, so God didn't alter Sihon's heart. He'd already come out to destroy Israel. The Lord merely allowed him to continue the path he had chosen. Right? Strengthening his resolve. Um, he's already set his heart against God, just like Pharaoh did. Pharaoh hardened his heart. How many times? Before the Lord had hardened his heart. And so um, he's already set this into motion, and the Lord is bringing overdue judgment um, to him and his army and also the whole ungodly society. Right? So make sure you make note of that if, uh, if that confuses you. When it says the Lord hardened his heart, his heart was already hard. He wanted to destroy the Israelites. Let's read Deuteronomy 2.34. At that time, we took all his towns and completely destroyed them. Men, women, and children, we left no survivors. Okay, and again, as I've said before, when we come into passages like this, it sounds like, you know, God is so brutal. It's such a harsh God, right? But again, we have to remember in the context uh, why this was in your home study? Why were they to leave no survivors, including women and children? Well, your class notes gives you uh, some cross references, and let's look up Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 18. However, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave anything alive, anything that breathes. Completely destroy him, destroy them. Sorry, the Hittites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites. High bites, Jebusites, mosquito bites, <laughs> as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. Okay. <laughs> I like Sorry. that. I think we're going to hear that a few more times now. Thank you. Yeah. So. <laughs> God knows these people, right? They're immoral. They have no fear of God. They worship all these satanic uh, gods, right? They kill their children. And, um, and any who would come through their uh, path, um, he's given them every opportunity to turn to him. They continue in their sin, continue to follow Satan, and they would lead Israel astray. That's why he's bringing the judgment that he promised way back to Abraham, right? Their sin has now reached its full measure. And um, that was a few hundred years ago. They were already so ungodly. Um, so their judgment is way overdue here. And then uh, Deuteronomy 7, verse 10, what does that tell us? But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Okay, and the word hate there also is the word for enemy. All right, they are. They have placed themselves as his enemy all right they reject him and stand strong against him and so he's bringing them their judgment and then deuteronomy 9 4 through 6 after the lord your god has driven them out before you do not say to yourself the lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness no it isn't 
account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land, but an account of the wickedness, wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. All right. So you say that a few times there, yeah. right? You think maybe they're getting it? It's not because of their righteousness. So again, it's because of Canaan's wickedness. And he says it three times here. It's time for their judgment. In fact, it's overdue. And again, if Canaan would repent, what would God do? He would spare them. He would forgive them. Okay, later uh, we see that Nineveh repents. And Nineveh was a very, very wicked um, city. Their history is just gruesome, very violent. Um, and when they repent, what did God do? He spared them. All right. So again, God's desire is not judgment. God's desire is repentance and relationship. All right. And so we have a loving, holy, righteous God now tells them to go out and wipe them all out because their time is up, because they refuse to turn to him. They all belong to Satan. They cling <coughs> to Satan. And he's given them over 500 years to repent. And now it's reached its full measure, as we said. And so um, they knew what God had done to Egypt. Don't you think they should start repenting yes. and turning to him? So even in that judgment brought on Egypt, they've had time, right? Does that make sense? And so some did and we see Rahab as an example of that, right? He is willing to all who turn to him. And so they're to kill everyone, man, woman, and child. And again, this is tough stuff to hear. And as we get into Joshua, we'll see them uh, carry it out. But their whole society, their whole way of thinking and living uh, is under judgment. And so um, in those days, if they did not kill the children, uh, revenge killing was expected. It wasn't just a possibility, it was expected you were required to revenge kill. Does that make sense? And so if they kept the children and brought them up, those children would kill them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so again, um, the women uh, would also do all they could to snare them into idolatry, right? And again, their uh, worship involved child sacrifice and other human sacrifice. They're totally sold out to Satan and death is the only way to deal with this. And they've had time to repent, right? And so, they are not innocent victims here. That's the thing we have to understand and be able to share with others, right? Um, and we see in Joshua that, as we said, God does accept and save those who turn to him. So let's uh, go back to Deuteronomy 3 and read 3 through 5. So the Lord your God also gave into our hands Thor, king of Bashan, and all his army. We struck them down, leaving no survivors at the time we took all his cities there are not one of the 60 cities that we did not take from them the whole region of Orgab Og's kingdom in Bashan all the cities that were fortified with high walls and with gates and bars and there were also a great many unwalled villages okay and so um, they destroyed what 60 cities and all their towns and all of them were fortified Okay, so box nine in your class notes there. Fortified cities. The previous generation was afraid because the enemy had fortified cities. This generation takes 60 cities that all were fortified with high walls. They followed God and won the victory. This generation could do what the faithless generation before them could not do. All right, so the very, very things that the previous generation feared, this generation is just doing. Does that make sense? Fortified cities are no problem for God. And so Moses here is reminding them uh, of all of this. And so um, there in uh, the rest of uh, Deuteronomy 3, we see the division of the land uh, given. And um, you can, in box 10, tells you the cross-reference that uh, back to Numbers 32. And then Deuteronomy 3, let's read 23 through 26. At that time I pleaded with the Lord, Sovereign Lord, you have begun to show 
to your servants your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven and earth, who can do those deeds and mighty works you do? Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, the fine hill country in Lebanon. But because of you, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. That's enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me anymore about this matter. Okay, so Moses is retelling them this account, and we see his regrets and uh, that he pled with the Lord uh, to be able to enter the land. Um, but changing the penalty would not be just, right? God had set the penalty. Now he needs to carry through. And if he changed it this time, why not always, right? Everyone could plead for a change here. And so how could we trust his word to be true if, he's always, if there's always that possibility of changing his mind, right? God does not change his mind like we do here. And so, um, box 11 in your class notes, characteristic of God, he's trust, trustworthy, he will do what he says. So he had told Moses, he will not enter the land, and so he will not enter the land, and the Lord says, don't speak of it anymore. It's, it's done. All right. And there's your in box 12, um, some cross-references, lots of those this week. And then in Deuteronomy uh, 32, we get God's opinion of what Moses had done. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 51. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Okay, he did not uphold God's holiness. He took God's word lightly. He did things the way he wanted. Isn't that powerful? You know, we often have our list of what's really bad sins and what's not so bad. Well, he didn't uphold God's holiness. God told him, speak to the rock, and he struck the rock. Huge sin, right? Think about that in our own life, in our own words here. And so, again, God's standards um, and... Our standards, the problem with our standards of what we think is right and wrong is we'll always, our standards will always allow us to justify sin. Right? right? That's why we go to God's standards. All right. Um, so again, this did not end God's love for Moses. And it didn't end the relationship. It's just the penalty for sin. Does that make sense? And we're going to see some very cool things about uh, Moses, uh, I think, next week. But um, let's go back to Deuteronomy 4 and read verses 1 and 2. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land, the Lord of the land, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it. But keep the commands of the Lord your God that I gave you. Okay, so in his context here, in his first speech here, he just gets done saying, I pled with the Lord to let me go in, and he says, enough. And here he says, don't add to what God says. Don't take away from what God says, right? He learned that the hard way here, all right? And so the word, uh, you can circle the word here if you want to, and right in your margin, it's the word um, Shema. This is in box 13. The word here is the Hebrew word Shema, which means to hear, to listen and understand and obey. It means to listen attentively so you can do what is said. All right. And James uh, 1.22, what does that tell us? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. When we come to the very words of God here, don't deceive yourselves. Don't just merely listen. Don't just merely read is what he's telling us. Do what it says. All right. So um, Moses is coming to the end of his uh, speech here, and he's telling them to listen, to listen carefully. It's the idea of cupping their ears so they hear every word, so they do not add to and they do not take away. They follow the Lord clearly uh, and obey. And so he reminds them in verses uh, 3 and 4, he reminds them of what happened to the Israelites who worshipped uh, the Baal of Peor. We covered that uh, last week. Um, and he reminds them, uh, because they did not do this, they're still alive today. Those that worship the Baal of Peor have died, right? They were punished. They were put to death. And so he reminds them of that. 
And there's your uh, cross references in uh, box 14 there. And then um, in your home study, page 131, it says, uh, read Deuteronomy 4 and put yourself there. Listen to Moses as he pleads with the Israelites to follow and obey God. And uh, write out the commands as if you were the one receiving them. Let's go ahead and read. I'll read Deuteronomy 4, verses uh, beginning in 5. He says, See, I have taught you uh, decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may, you can highlight in green, follow them in the land you're entering to take possession of. What are they to do in verse 6? Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who hear about these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? In verse 9, only be careful. You can underline that or highlight it green. And watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them, remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to you, Assemble the people before me and hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and teach them to their children. So again, they are seeing this. They saw what happened to the previous generation who turned from God and they need to teach their children. It's not their children that grew up under this, right? If they don't teach their children, how will their children know? Right? They need to teach their children in each generation. Verses uh, 11. Uh, you came near and stood at the foot of mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of the words but saw no form. There was only a voice. And then jump down to 15. You saw no form of any kind on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or animal or on the earth or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters uh, below. And when you look up at the sky and see the sun, moon, and the stars in the heavenly array, do not be enticed to bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has appointed to all the nations under heaven. And so again, he's warning them because these are things that they're going to see in uh, Canaan. They're things they saw in Egypt. And so God had shown them no form, just a voice, because he knows that humans are prone to want to make something and worship it instead of him. All right? And you see, um, he mentions the stars too, looking for wisdom from the stars. Uh, do we have any of that today? Wow, does God know humans or what? And he says, do not do that. He wants them to worship the creator, not the created. All right, so in Deuteronomy uh, 4.24, uh, Mo uh, Moses, uh, notice the words Moses used to describe God. This was in your home study. What does that tell you about God in your old life? Let's read Deuteronomy 4.24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. All right, and you see that is a name of God. What name of God is that? Do you remember? Have you marked that? El Quana. All right, so be sure to mark that in there. He is all-consuming fire. He's a jealous God. God desires 100% of your devotion, right? He sums it up with love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Have nothing else before him. Um, he's jealous of our relationship with him, jealous for. Now, we often have a hard time with that word jealous because we put sin into it, mm -hmm. right? This is not, uh, this is not sinful jealousy. Um, El Quana, box 15, the Lord is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He's zealous for what belongs to him. He's compelled to pursue us. He loves us with a love that is not satisfied until that love is returned. He's jealous of your devotion and your love. He loves you with an everlasting love. And we already covered this in Lesson 17 on page uh, 90. Um, you can go back to that. So again, a lot of people have a hard time with this, but you have to understand in God's uh, 
uh, God, there is no sin in God's righteous uh, jealousy. Um, jealousy in a sinful way is wanting something you don't have or wanting it for your own selfish reasons, right? You're jealous because you want it or you want it a certain way. God is jealous for what already is His. He's jealous for those that belong to Him, that they remain with Him. It's kind of like a marriage relationship, and that makes a little more sense for us, right? If we belong to God, we're to follow Him. We have that relationship with Him. In a marriage relationship, you don't want them, the spouse, chasing after other relationships, right? That, doesn't that make sense? What happens when that happens? There's a breach in your relationship, right? Now do you understand? God here, uh, again, that causes grief. And God's love for us is so great, He doesn't want a distant relationship. He wants us to love Him the way He loves us. And so He pursues us. Do we pursue Him? That's the question. Let's read uh, Deuteronomy 4, 25. Um, I will read this. After you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God, and arouse his anger, I call the heavens and the earth as witness against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long. You will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord has driven you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell but if from there you seek the Lord your God you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and all your soul even in the rewarning and, and retelling of this he shows them what it is to belong to God right God doesn't want part he wants all so when you are in distress and all those things have happened to you then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and what does what do you do when you return to the Lord your God you obey Him. You repent, you obey Him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which He confirmed to them with an oath. And so again, box 16, characteristic of God, He's a merciful God. His desire is that they turn to Him, that they follow Him. He does not want to destroy these others. He wants them to repent. And so Moses ends the first uh, of his three speeches uh, with these thoughts in chapter 4, verse uh, 32. He says, Ask now about the former days, long before your time, from the day God created human beings on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything so great as this ever happened, or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of the fire as you have and lived? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? You were shown these things, why? So that you might know that the Lord is God and beside him there is no other. Be sure to mark what is God's purpose in doing all this for them. So they will know he is God. From the heavens he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth he showed you his great fire and you heard his words from out of the fire. Because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after him. He brought you out of Egypt by his presence and great strength. To drive out before you the nations greater and stronger than you. To bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance. As it is today, acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Keep his decrees and his commands, which I'm giving you today, so that it will go well with you and your children after you and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you uh, for all time. And so again, you hear Moses pleading with them through this. Um, they're shown these things so they might know that he's God. Um, take what they know and apply it and live it and teach their children. And so there, um, next in uh, Deuteronomy 4, the rest of Deuteronomy 4 there, we cover the cities of refuge and the cross references are there in box uh, 17. These are all things we've covered before. And then we see he starts his second speech and we're going to get uh, just into this a little bit. So that's the end of his uh, first speech 
there. And so you can write in your margin next to chapter 5 that this is Moses' second speech. It is Deuteronomy 5 through 26. We'll just get into a little bit about it. And so Moses had written the first speech. He stood up and he gave the speech to the people and then he left. And he writes this other speech and he's going to stand before them. And again, he's thinking of and praying, I'm sure, on his face before the Lord. What do they need to know? What do you want me to tell them before they go in the land here? So we see he stands before the people again. And before he had given them a speech regarding their history. And now um, he's going to show what God expects of them. And um, he's going to adapt the laws of Exodus to the new situations that they are going to continue. Remember, some of the laws that they had covered before was for their time in the desert. They're leaving the desert now, and they're going to go into the land. So let's go ahead and read uh, Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 4. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, <clears throat> Hear Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire of the mountain. Okay, so Moses opens his second speech, again, reminding them that the Lord made a covenant with them at Mount Horeb, at Mount Sinai. So they need to listen and hear and obey uh, what he has outlined for them. And Moses uses, you can circle the word hear again, that's the word Shema, like we covered before. Um, it means to listen intelligently, to understand and obey. And so they need to listen carefully to what the Lord uh, requires of them. And then Moses goes on and restates the Ten Commandments as part of that covenant that the Lord had given them at Mount Sinai and instructs them to follow and obey them. And um, in verse uh, Deuteronomy 5, verse 6 and 7, uh, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then verse 7 says, You shall have no other gods before me. And again, um, this is this. Verse 6 is the part of the covenant, uh, well, this is part of the covenant God made with them, and this is why they're to do uh, what he's called them to do. And it, it begins with the cause and effect, right? Now, what do we usually see when we talk about the Ten Commandments? Here's, a, here's an example, right? When, you, mm -hmm. when somebody mentions the Ten Commandments, what do you see? What's missing? Let's see if I can get that up there. The preamble's missing, right? Verse 6 is missing. Why shall they have no other gods? Why shall they not make an idol? Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The Lord is stating who he is and what he has done. And because of that, this is what they're supposed to do. Does that make sense? We always skip that part and jump right into the thou shalt nots. Okay, well, why does he say not to do these things? It's because of who he is. It's because of what he's done. He rescued them from slavery. He is their God. So again, important to know the context there, um, the reason for the commands. And so again, they're not to worship the false gods of uh, Egypt. They're not to worship the hippopotamus god, right? Or Hapi, the god of the Nile, or Ra, the sun god. Um, they're not to worship Moloch or Chemish, the gods of Canaan. They're to worship him. Does that make sense? He's the one who brought them out. They are to worship him. So again, you put it in its context. They're to have a covenant relationship with him. And all of God's laws make sense in a covenant relationship, right? And we tear them out and put them separate. And you hear people say, well, it's all this negative stuff. Okay, we'll put it back into that covenant relationship and what he's done for them. He brought them out of slavery to come unto, to follow him. He's, given, he's going to give them the land, and this is what they need to do. So... Uh, again, you put that into a marriage relationship. We would say, I am your spouse. You are to have no other spouses before me, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, duh, right? Now it makes perfect sense. Does that make sense? Look at the Ten Commandments that way. Uh, it doesn't even need mentioning. It's assumed. It's the same with the Lord. There's two kingdoms. There's Satan and there's the Lord's. All right, you can't belong to both. All right, he's rescued them out of that. They are not to follow Satan. <clears throat> Okay, let's read Deuteronomy 5, 8 through 9. 
You shall not make for yourself an image in any form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay, and we covered all of this in detail uh, back in Exodus here, but do you, do you hear the name of God there? Jealous God. Jealous. Yeah, El Quana. There's another uh, account here of El Quana. Um, and so, again, make no image to worship because I am El Quana. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Chuck Missler, uh, but I like his quote on this. He said, God wants to be number one on a list of one. <laughs> okay? No other choices. Yeah. All right. So nothing else comes close. All right. And then in uh, verse 11, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. He is your Lord. You are to be fully uh, devoted to him. You don't misuse his name. Uh, he won't hold you guiltless. That's right. All right. The Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So again, taking that seriously. And misuse means in vain or it means to attach emptiness to it to demean it. Anything about the Lord to demean it. All right. So again, it's not just using the Lord's name as a swear word, but in any way that we would demean the Lord. Okay. And so again, a person was to uphold their family name, right? Not to misuse it or to bring shame. And so if you belong to the Lord and you're shaming his name in any way, right? Doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, and then he goes on uh, the Ten Commandments, as we said. The first ones are about the uh, relationship with the Lord, and the last ones are our relationship uh, with others, to love one another. And why are they to do this? Because he is the Lord, their God, who redeemed them. All right, let's read Deuteronomy 5, 22 through 27. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to hear your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tab tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice of, out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me, and you said, The Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die after we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. And if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard of the voice of the living God speaking out of the fire, as we have, and survived? <clears throat> Go near and listen to all, the pe to all that the Lord our God says. Tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you, we will listen and obey. Okay, so here we see again in his retelling here in his second speech that they distanced themselves from God. They wanted a mediator, right? They had a fear of God, but the wrong kind, the kind that, that uh, distanced them from him. And in uh, 5 verse uh, 26, uh, we have another adjective uh, to describe God, another name of God. Uh, in verse 26, do you see what it is? You can highlight in orange the words, the living God. That's another name for God. And that's in box 18 of your class notes. The living God. And interesting enough, uh, it means like fresh moving water. It's referring to life, refreshing, quenching of thirst. And you have several cross references there. And we're going to see this name used again in Joshua here. But uh, you can add that to your names of God topic sheet. And then let's turn to John 7, 37 and 38. For just a moment. That's page 1676, John 7, 37 and 38 is one of your references there. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Okay, so Jesus offers himself as El Che, the living water. Isn't that interesting? So again, more characteristics of God here. And we learn so much about him through his names. Um, we have another one here if we get to it tonight. Um, so in your home study, it said, Notice God's longing for his people to obey him. Let's read Deuteronomy 5, 28 and 29. 
The Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Okay, so the word good, when the Lord says everything they said was good. Now remember, what did they just say? Uh, we're going to keep our distance from him. Uh, you, you go talk to him, Moses. We'll keep our, and the Lord says everything they said is good. All right, the word good does not mean good. Okay, what the word there means uh, is actually what God is saying is he heard what they said and they were right. They didn't want to come close to him. All right, and so then that prompts him to say what his desire for them is. They've just said, how can we live with living uh, water here with El Che? Um, you go talk to them, we'll stay our distance, and the Lord says what they said is right. That's exactly where they're at. But what is his desire? That their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep my commandments so it would go well with them. Mm -hmm. He wants that relationship with the proper fear of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? So write that in uh, next to circle good if you want that he's saying they are right. And that was your uh, uh, memory verse here. That's it. God's will for life. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, um, again, we'll um, just read a couple more here and finish up in verse 30. And 31, he goes on. The Lord says, go, uh, tell them, return to their tents, but you stay with me so I can give you the commands and decrees and laws. You are to teach them. Uh, to follow in the land I am given you. And so in verse uh, 32, again, be careful. Are you catching that word a lot? Yeah, yes. You think he means it? Now, why do you have to tell somebody to be careful? Because the tendency be <laughs> is, is to not, yeah. right? So be careful. Do not turn aside to the right or left. Walk in obedience to all the Lord your God commands you so that you may live and prosper prolong your days in the land uh, that you will possess. So again, um, this is what they need to do to have that true relationship with the Lord. So you can highlight those things in green if you would like to uh, circle the word uh, all. So again, Moses is telling them to be careful because their normal tendency would just to be go do what uh, they want. And so it takes an intentional focus and determination, doesn't it, with us as well? We have to have that intentional focus to be in God's Word, to learn His Word. Okay, and so this is what He's called them to do. And we're going to go ahead and um, uh, stop there this evening. We've almost uh, finished the whole lesson here. Um, but we'll pick up there in His uh, second speech next week. Is there any questions or thoughts? Why do you suppose that they, they didn't go, I mean, they, were, they said they were afraid of God, but they've been dealing with God all along. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they're afraid of it. Yeah. Do you think they just didn't want to hear any more rules because they wanted to mm -hmm. be able well, to do their own thing? Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is Moses is reminding them of way back when they were at the mountain, when they had first come out of Egypt. So that's why Deuteronomy is a little confusing because he's going back and he's telling their beginning story if this makes sense. So this was way back when they were at the mountain and God spoke to them out of the mountain. So they didn't know the Lord well yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, this was right they, after the plague. They, uh, they communicated with him one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. at the mountain, right? Moses did. Moses did. Moses did. They did, they did see no, they, well, they saw the fire and the shaking, trembling mountain that caused them to be afraid, but they wanted to stay their distance from him. So this was way back early on in their relationship with the but Lord. But still they were convinced that that was God. Yes, yes, and they then had no here, doubt. And they're still convinced that that's God. Yes. But do you think maybe they didn't want it to be person to person, or God to yeah. person, because yeah. they wanted to be able to say, well, God didn't tell us to do that. Quite possibly. And if you remember, they've just come out of Egypt. Were they personal with the gods in Egypt? No, they have no relationship with them. They just do what's required. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then and here, sacrifice something and then yeah, do okay. Exactly. But this God it. wants a personal relationship. Right. That's scary, right? Yeah. They don't want that relationship. They want to stay. And so this is going way back at the beginning when they're still back at the mountain. This is his second speech. So he's going back even further here in his second speech, telling them these things. And then through their journey, they're going to learn what it is to follow the Lord. Does that make sense? 
but here he's telling them where they were in the beginning. Uh, and yeah, we see they never really do quite get it, do they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we see that because they think they're following Moses, that Moses led them out of Egypt. And then later, who do they give the credit to? The golden calves led them out of Egypt. Right, very fickle. They're used to worshiping an object. Yeah, yeah, that you can control something made with hands, so it will. It's tame. Yeah, yeah. Rather than this fearsome, awesome God. Yeah, it's a good question. Does that make sense? Any any other questions on that? Okay. Well, if you are interested in doing the uh, coming early um, for some tips on memorizing by heart rather than by head. Um, rather than rote memory, we can meet next week. What time did I say? 5.45. Does that work for you? Um, so sign up if you think of it. If you think you'd like to come, sign up so I have some idea of what to bring. Um, okay, anything else? Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you again for this night. Thank you for your word and what you've taught us through it. And Father, as Moses, his last month on this earth, um, is just reminding these Israelites of their history and of what you require of them and challenging them to obey you completely as they go and take possession of, of what you had promised uh, to Abraham. Father, we just thank you for, for Moses' heart and uh, even though he cannot enter the land, his heart was for them to follow him. Father, may we be like Moses and be uh, encouraging to others and pointing them to your word and uh, to a relationship with you. Just uh, go with us this week as we continue to uh, learn from this account in Deuteronomy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.